everyone and welcome to Mark's English History channel on here on YouTube and today is the 25th of October and it's a very special day in English history for today known in the medieval calendar as the eve of St Crispin is the anniversary of one of England's most famous battles and victories the Battle of Agincourt where Henry V depleted army of less than 4,000 men annihilate a French force roughly in a region of about 24,000. So numbers serving in medieval battles are always a little bit hit and miss. We're not too sure exactly how many. There's certain roles that we can look at and there's a few uh, chronicles. But what we can comfortably say is that it is an overwhelming French force that is going to be facing the English on, on this anniversary. And that this little ragtag bunch of English soldiers managed to win a major significant victory. So first of all, how do we get here? So the year is 1415. And we're, in, we're, we're looking at the middle period of the Hundred Years' War. A little over 70 years before, King Edward I had declared himself through his mother, Isabella, known as the She-Wolf of France, as the rightful heir of the Kingdom of France, unleashing a bit of war that's going to last on and off for about 120 years. The early stage of the war is a catalogue of remarkable successes for the English army, for the English, under the father-son duo of Edward III and his son Edward, the Prince of Wales, known to history as the Black Prince because of the colour that he wears, the armour he wears in one of the major battles, the Battle of Cressy. You were gonna do so. You get these two early war victories: Cressy in 1346, and ten years later, Poitiers in 1356, where the Black Prince manages to capture the King, King John, the King of France. However, uh, since then, Edward III has died. His son, having died before him, the crown passed to his to his younger son, so Edward III's grandson, Richard II. So Richard's reign proved to be one of domestic struggles. As a young king, he deals with the peasants' revolt, but from then on, it be, he becomes a bit of a tyrant and unleashes a lot of issues. So the war with France goes on to the back burner. He's eventually deposed by his cousin and Henry V's father, Henry Bolingbroke. So when Henry V comes to the throne, he once again takes up the calls for the king, the crown of France to be his. And having been stubbed diplomatically in his efforts, Henry plans for war. So Henry's plan, plans to sail to Normandy and to launch, a num, uh, launch an arm raid known as a chevauchet through France down to the south in Gascony, which is at this point in time controlled by the English. However, things won't quite go as Henry planned. So, first of all, Henry's forces land at land in the Seine Estuary at the port of Harfleur on the 13th of August. The Norman fort, however, refuses to surrender and the long siege sets in. So, for the best part of the late summer and early autumn, the siege of Harfleur continues and eventually on the 23rd of September, having no support from the, from the French army, the town surrenders and Henry allows them is allowed to enter the city. However, the damage has already been done to Henry's army, because at this point, the city's defenders had opened the sluice gates and flooded the surrounding areas of, of the town, which is where the English army is encamped. So living in these marshy conditions, disease soon sets in, and the best part of Henry's army has come, will succumb to dysentery at this point. So it leaves Henry with a with a, with a bit of a, with a dilemma as to what he's going to do. So with his decimated army decimated, he decides to leave a garrison in Harfleur and to march the remaining healthy force to Calais again, another English possession, where they could return home and try again in the following year with obviously Harfleur and both, both Harfleur and Calais being in English hands, he has a launch pad to m make that, this assault. So on the 8th of October, 1415, the force leaves Harfleur for the march of around about 170 miles or so to Calais. There's only one natural obstacle in the in the way, and that is, and that is a river that will become synonymous to the to, to the British Army some 500 years later, 
and what we'll probably do a video at some point on it's the, the river Somme. so henry's force is marching towards along parallel to the coast and he's aiming for the ford at brush and tiqua i hope that's the right pronunciation which is the first ford inland from the from the Somme estuary and they arrive around about the 13th of October however they capture a prisoner in the days leading up to this point and they find out that the ford is guarded by the constable of France de Albrecht and a force of around 600 6,000 men are waiting them at the nearby in the nearby town of Abbeville so Henry is forced to turn inland away from the sea to try and find the crossing point and at this point there's a race along the banks of the Somme with both the French army on the western side and the English army on the eastern side racing along the river to try and find an unguarded crossing point. And salvation comes for the English in the shape of a large meander on the river Somme. It bends around to the west so it means that the French army have to march the entirety of the loop well, it was for the English, what they managed to do is find a route across land that cuts off the corner so that they're able to get back onto the straight part of the river faster and able to then find an unguarded, an unguarded ford. Having done that, they gain this ford, they cross the river and the road to Calais is thus once again open and they're able to march on. But where are the French? because they've been caught out by this meander and what what instead they've done is they haven't allowed the English just to cross they've realized what's going to happen and they've made actually a beeline inland away from the river itself to try and cut the line of the road at a point of their choosing and what they're doing is they're giving ground to the English army as it's advancing just waiting for the moment that they can find the spot of land that they want to, to then launch their assaults and they find they eventually find a position that they want wish to fight close to a chateau known as Azinko and it's here that the English advance guard will run into the French army on the 24th of October 1415 and the scene is set for the following day and the battle. That night, the English spend the night in silent contemplation of what is to come. They're outnumbered. They're not in the best state of health or fitness. They're expecting a quite a, right, this is going to be a big test for them. The French on the other hand spend the night drinking and frolicking because they just think they're going to walk over the English army in the following day. So, so what do the troops wake up to that morning? So when they wake up in the English camp you look along the line of the road to which the advance to Calais will take place and ahead of them is this large array of French army on the other side of a ploughed wet sodden wet sodden field the images from the first world war of this this area of france and flanders are the same 500 years earlier it's ploughed it's wet it's soggy it's going to come into the actual battle a lot later on so that, that's what they're looking at the, the field itself is flanked on either side by by wood and the Closest to the French, closer to the French lines than the English are at this point. These woods actually narrow the field down and make it into a funnel, funnel shape. And again, this is going to become important as the battle begins and rages. So about ten thirty in the morning, Henry gathers his troops and gives them a speech about the upcoming battle. Now I know. Shakespeare's speech, St. Crispin's Day speech, is not the speech that he gives, but it's such a good speech that it can't, we can kind of ignore that, that he doesn't give that exact speech. And it, 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 but whatever he, did, whatever he does say, it does do the trick. What we believe he mentioned to the archers in particular is that, he will, that the French will cut off their bow fingers, which gives the 
which is the rumoured origin to the famous English B sign as a taunting to the Frenchmen that they still have their fingers. About 11 o'clock, Henry leads his army out on the field. As they advance out, they kneel, they kneel, cross themselves, and then advance to the positions. Now, Henry is a very good tactician, and he plays a tactical masterstroke at this point because he advances his army a lot closer to the French lines than everybody is expecting. Uh, there's two reasons for this. First of all, is to put most of the French army into the range, into that 250 yard range, effective range of the Lombo, the principal weapon in the English army. The French army uses crossbow, they have a longer range, slightly lower, slower, slower base of fire, but by moving them closer, he's put in, he, his army in range to, to attack. But also what he's doing by moving them that far, that, close, that further position forward is to bring them into the position where those woods narrow. So he, it's protecting the flanks. It's put, he's gonna push the French army in closer. So the French ca can't bring the weight and numbers advantage that they would hope because they can't stretch, they're not gonna be stretching the English force. It's gonna be confined and it's gonna create a killing ground for the English. And that is the situation at the beginning of, of, of the battle. So the French will the first, make their first move, and that is to send forward the, their crossbowmen. So as I've already mentioned, the crossbowmen have a greater range, of, greater range, because it's a more mechanical machine. But the rate of fire is a, is a lot slower. Compared to the longbow, the crossbow, in my opinion, is the precursor, or the drill involved, is the precursor to the musketry drill that you will see in the English Civil War, and then on into flintlock, the flintlock era, where it's three, three ranks of men, okay, later it becomes two, working in unison, so one, one is always ready to fire whilst the other two are reloading. And so what happens is that they push the, uh, the crossbowmen forward, they lose one volley each, and then they retire because they are scared of the incoming fire that will come from the, from the English longbowmen. Because unlike the, unlike the crossbowmen, the longbow, it, it, it's a standard manually operated weapon. It is very, very fast, probably around about 10 arrows a minute, something like that, a, a good archer could fire as compared to the one to two a minute that a crossbowman could. So crossbows begin their life as a weapon in fortifications where you can get away with that slower rate of fire because you're under protection of the of the fortification in the open field like this. You saw you see it at Cressy. The scars of Cressy run deep. The French crossbowmen do not want to be under this arrow storm that they are expecting. So they retire. So with the retreat of the crossbowmen, the fragmented command of the French army starts to rear its head. It's, it's one of the major failings of this French army at Agincourt is that there's no consolidated command structure. So, and each, each commander is out for his own gain and glory here. So instead of concentrate concerted attacks by different French formations to weaken certain positions of the English army and then to gain a strong hold and, and to defeat them. Each division kind of attacks piecemeal independently of each other. And the first to do that is the is the French cavalry. So they charge and what they are intending to do is to try to hit the flanks. But as we've already discussed, the English movement forward being flanked by these two Two, two dense woodlands means that they can't do this. So what happens is, is that they, they charge down the two flanks, but they get pushed together in the middle and funneled in. And there's no room. And, then, and this is then when the English unleash the first of the arrow storms that go over. And legend has it that the, that 
that the thickness of the arrows in the air was so dense that the sky turned dark. And it decimates this French cavalry charge. It, it pushes them into retreat. They, as they've come up the outside and then been pushed in, they they they, they kind of re they retreat through the centre. And what happens is they, they charge straight into the advance in French men at arms infantry, first infantry division. And it causes a it causes chaos in that centre. It's still under the arrow storm. Eventually, this this infantry division manages to extract itself from the cavalry from the retreating cavalry and do advance onto the English lines again, completely under the attack of of, of the arrow storms. And eventually, they do make it to the to the English lines, and they they engage in hand to hand combat with the English men at arms. And at this point, Henry's uncle, the Duke of York, is killed. He will be the highest ranking member of the English aristocracy killed at Agincourt. But although the English and the French men at arms are well matched in terms of their equipment and their armour, the English archers, who are now at this point have kind of become redundant, are less armoured, more, more nimble, more mobile, and they set about their work of dispatching fallen, fallen knights with knives through helmet slits, hammers over the, over the head, and unlike the knightly class who would have tried to take prisoners for ransom, the peasant class of the, of the archers, it's kill or be killed. So they then attack the attack the down knights and and slaughter them. At this point, and eventually this army, this first division, is started to is started to be pushed back. But what happens is that, is, is that the French second division. Infantry division has already begun to advance, and they slam into the back of the retreat in first division. So the, the the first division has nowhere to go, so they are forced back onto the weapons of of, of the English. And a lot of people have described this more like a crush effect at a football stadium or something like that, rather than a out and out battle. And you're getting a lot of there's there's just nowhere for them to go. They they're getting pushed down. There's certainly a number of the French casualties drown at this point because they they they're down. They're in the mud. They're in the arm. And they just can't get up. And then they're almost trodden into the in, further into the ground. And at this point, the French commanders, the Albrecht and Bacaclot, are killed. Bacqueville. Carrying the sacred Oriflamme flam, Oriflamme flag is also killed, and the flag itself is lost in the mud, um, never to be seen again. Seeing this carnage ensue ahead of them, the third division just flatly refused to move, um, and the battle at this point is pretty much done. Um, you're not going to the the third division do not do not enter the assault. There's a small caveat to that final act, so to speak, of the battle, and this occurs in the rear where Isambard as in core, the local landowner, leads a small raiding force, possibly from the French lines, possibly from the Chateau at Agincourt itself, not too sure, into the rear of the English and to attack, and to attack the camp there. Fearing that this is more than what it is and that it's actually a revolt for the prisoners held back at the, the camp. Henry orders all but the most prominent prisoners to be executed. And this is not taken too well by his knightly class because they see the ransoms going away if they execute the prisoners. And so they kind of refuse to do it, but the archers just get on and they 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 slaughter, they slaughter the prisoners. So in total, the battle probably lasts around ninety to ninety minutes to two hours. 
during which time the cream of French nobility are wiped out. Um, it is a devastating loss for, for, for the French army. And Henry's small band is free to march on to Calais and then on to ships for home, where they're eventually greeted as returning heroes. A year later, Henry returns to France and launches another campaign. And eventually with these campaigns, he manages to win the hand of the daughter of the King of France. And he is himself named heir to the king upon his passing. Now, unfortunately, Henry doesn't survive long enough to claim the French throne. However, the son, Henry VI, does. But like with most medieval kings, a strong ki the son of a strong king is, tends to be quite weak. And he doesn't hold them for much longer. And actually, by the end of the Hundred Years' War, England has lost all possessions in France bar Calais. Um, that falls a, a little bit later. And... Agincourt really is the high point, shall we say, um, of the middle section. So obviously Cressy Poitiers, a huge Agincourt. Agincourt gets the bigger audience, shall we say, to speak, mainly because of Shakespeare's play, Henry V comes out, is all about it. And it elevates Henry to a, a slightly higher status, shall we say. But also because of it, the underdog story, how many are outnumbered by it and the greatness of the victory. It's a great victory in terms of that, 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 those, those examples. However, if you were to look at it in a strategic tactical point of view, it's not as not that important a battle. It, it certainly it isn't. It's not a Hastings, it's not a Bosworth in terms of significant medieval battles that is going to massively change the outcome of English history. But it is one of my favourites, so I will, um, I will allow that one. So, yep, ho hope you enjoyed that. Any questions, drop me some comments in there and I'll be answering them and I will let you know when I'm next back on with a different different anniversary or a different era of history talking about so hope you enjoy it and leave any comments leave some likes thank you